So we finished off the second session yesterday by having you write down three questions. Does anybody have those written down? Do you remember what the three questions were? No. Yes. All right. What's the first question that I asked? Why is it important to get more spin? Why is it important to get more spin? So can anybody answer that question for us? Why is it important to get more spin? Yeah. It creates a, a greater problem for your opponent. Greater problem for your opponent, right? right? So the opponent has to be more precise as far as the racket angle, the timing, and the stroke. Because right. if they just try to slap you around, potentially, they could be hitting the ball in the net, hitting the ball out. So it gives more problems for the opponent. Good. What else? Well, it gives you more control. Gives you more control. And not just as far as the placement, but also as far as the depth goes as well. Imagine if you want to play a sharp angle ball off the side of the table, and you don't have a lot of top spin. Imagine how hard it is to hit that type of an angle if you don't have the ball dipping down. Imagine if you're trying to return the ball short, but you don't have any backspin on your push. It's very difficult to return the ball short. So it makes it harder on your opponent, gives you more control. What else? Um, Go more, more consistency in terms of, from, the, from your perspective, in terms of keeping the ball on the table. More right. spin uh, prevents the likelihood of the ball missing the table. Right, so there's two common ways to miss. You can miss out or you can miss in the net. Mm -hmm. So when you have that top spin on the ball, mm -hmm. it helps solve both problems. It helps clear the net and it helps to bring the ball down. Right. Good. And there's one final one. Why else will more spin help you out? Bjorn, you know? Anwin? More potential for power. Okay, imagine if I'm playing, let's say, hard bat. All right, hard bat is short pitch with no sponge, and the ball drops, and it's three inches below the table, way down here. What is the chance with a racket with no spin that I'd be able to hit the ball hard? Right? You can't, right? You have to really be picky as far as which ball you hit and which ball you don't. Whereas when you have more spin, you have more potential for power, even on a ball that would be less likely to be able to hit. Imagine if I serve the ball low and short here. How hard can you hit that ball? Well, it depends if you have spin or not. If you don't have spin at all and you just whack the ball, of course you're not going to be able to clear the net, right? But if you have plenty of spin, now you can make the ball arc. So you can hit harder shots even from difficult balls. Okay. So if you don't have spin, you really have to be picky as far as choosing this particular ball or this particular ball to hit hard. But when you have spin, even if the ball is relatively low, you can still hit a medium power or even a high power shot. Does that make sense? At the lower level, it doesn't necessarily make sense because basically for a beginner, you ping the ball back and forth until somebody pops it up and then wham, you hit a winner, right? But at the higher level, if you're waiting for this ball to come, you might be waiting a long time, unless you're playing a lobber. But usually you're going to be waiting a long time for that particular ball to come. So any questions on the first point that we had? Why is more spin important? Any questions on that point? Okay. If you don't understand that, then this whole thing for me teaching you, okay, here's how you have to relax your grip, here's how you have to hold the racket, here's how you have to hit the ball, all those things aren't gonna make sense if you're not convinced that more spin is important, okay? So I don't want it to just be something like, yeah, Samson says in general I need to work on more spin. It needs to be something that you're actually convicted of. Like, look, if I can generate more spin, I can really get to the next level, or I can get to two levels higher. So how about side spin? Side uh, spin. the same rules apply to just general spin in yeah. the case of side spin? Okay, so as it relates to side spin, are you talking about on the serve and serve return, or are you talking about in the in, rally? In, in a rally where you and we are not gonna... only top spin and, you know, place it, uh, but give some side spin as well. Yeah, so we're going to be working on that quite a bit okay. on Friday. So that's a separate... We're going to be working on inside-out loop and outside-in loop, and this is fairly advanced, and I don't necessarily think you guys are going to get it, but I want to at least introduce it to you so you understand. Plus, if you understand how to do it, you can also understand how to return it as well. Okay. Um, is for the side spin, one thing that I have to keep in mind, and I have to keep reminding my students, is it's usually used to control the ball, not necessarily used to just outright trick your opponent. So for example, if you play against my wide forehand, okay, and if I dive for the ball and I hit down the line or to the middle, oftentimes I'm gonna get burned here. If I can break the ball from my wide forehand far enough to your forehand, direction of travel is gonna be more this way, it's better. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I use side spin in this situation 
not to trick you, but so that I can control the ball where I want it, and so that your like, likelihood of coming back towards me is better. To give yourself a better position in the next shot. Yeah. So. Even for like blocking, sometimes lately I've been doing more side spin blocks. Sometimes I'll block normal, sometimes I'll block a little bit of side spin. Why do I block side spin? Is it really to trick the other guy? Yes and no, but I can get a sharper angle, I can kill the speed on the ball, and I can place the ball differently than if I gave like a top spin ball. So I think a lot of people say, hey Samson, would you please teach me a tricky side spin shot during the rally? And it's like, it's fine to use those, and sometimes they do trick the opponent. But most of the time you're using side spin to make the ball do what you want. Okay. Sometimes when I'm stuck in the middle and I want to play a backhand out wide to my opponent's uh, wide forehand, I'll play an outside in backhand this way to make the ball curve further over. So it's allowing me to place the ball in a different location than I would be able to normally if I hadn't put side spin on. Good. Good. Okay, so we'll, we'll, go ahead. Is that the same thing for the serve too? Do you do you ever put side spin to kind of trick the opponent on the serve, or does it help with the placement? So side spin on the serve is a little bit of a different situation. The side spin on the serve is usually used to disguise the backspin topspin. So imagine if you and I were playing a match and I just serve whoosh topspin or mm -hmm. chung backspin. Right. It's pretty obvious, like okay, that's backspin. Everybody in the gym saw, okay, Samson just served topspin, right? But if I'm able to serve side spin, it's easier to like hide the subtle amounts of backspin or subtle amounts of topspin. Because you see the big motion, this is the side spin, but did I hit the ball this way or did I hit the ball this way? It's a little bit blurry. It's kind of hard for you to see. Does that make sense? So a lot of times the side spin on the serve is used to disguise the backspin and topspin. Okay. okay. Good. All right. What was this? Sorry. Uh, go for it. Uh, I know, especially with pin holders, you side spin to, I guess, to some degree, control the return. Where you know, if they put a, a side spin in a certain direction, they will position themselves at a certain angle to the table because they know that's where the ball is going most likely to come. Mm -hmm. uh, is that is that one? Uh, possible reason why side spin will be employed during service? Potentially, and especially at the beginner and intermediate level, mm -hmm. it happens more often like that. Mm -hmm. At the advanced level, they're able to receive to different locations, but they position themselves based on the most likely or more, most difficult return. Mm -hmm. But they are able to receive in different, different positions. Mm -hmm. But at the lower level, yeah, okay, if I serve side spin this way, and the other guy pings it back, it's most likely going to this side. If I serve side spin this way, and he pings it back, it's most likely coming to this side. Right. But at the higher level, it, there's a few different things there. Right. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to this side, or it's going to that side. Good, what was the second question we dealt with last night? I didn't answer it, but I just threw it out there for you to write down. How to know you're getting more spin. <laughs> How do you know that you're getting more spin? So I told you you can use your senses. See it, feel it, hear it. You probably can't taste it. Unless victory is so close that you can taste the victory. So how could you see it? How can you see if you're getting more spin? The uh, arc of the ball and the bounce of the ball. The arc of the ball and the bounce of the ball. And you can also see the reaction from your opponent's racket. Imagine if you're spinning, I'm your practice partner, you're spinning and I'm blocking, and you try to adjust your technique. You try to use a little more wrist, or you try to use your forearm, you try to wait for the ball longer, you try to relax more, you try to accelerate through more, and you change something, and I block normal, and the ball goes jumping up. You can say, yes, I did something different because I saw a different reaction. So both things are true. Seeing your type of ball that you're giving, but also seeing the reaction when your opponent hits it. That's, a, that's an indicator as to how much spin you're getting. Good. What else? What do you think, Scott? Um, well, so you just said racket angle of the opponent. Okay, so the reaction from the opponent's racket. Besides seeing, how could you tell by hearing? Well, you can hear the definitely off the, the rubber. If it's got more wood so in it. Right. Hitting it, or if it's got brush sound to it. Right, so there's, there's three aspects of your racket, the top sheet, the sponge, and the wood, right? So when you're just hitting the top sheet, you're gonna hear a lighter grazing, grazing sound. If you're hitting deeper into the wood or into the sponge, you're gonna hear more of a knock sound. So you should be able to hear based on the type of spin that you're giving. For complete beginners, I recommend that they just use their top sheet and just work on brushing. And then they watch Chance or I play, and they're like, yeah, but you're not spinning the ball because I hear a 
we are spinning the ball, but we're doing what's called gumming, where we're hitting deep into the wood, sponge and wood, as well as using the top sheet. So the type of spin that you're giving, whether it be just the top sheet, or if you're hitting deeper into the sponge or wood, it should be able to tell what the sound is. So if you're a beginner, intermediate level player, you really want to strive for just a very, very quiet, that kind of motion. You don't really want to hit into the wood. What about feel, Scott? Are you able to feel a difference in your forehand loop if you spin or you don't spin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What's it going to feel like? Well, the opponent should feel, you should see the kick off their paddle. No, but I'm talking about at the point of contact. When you're hitting the ball? When you hit the ball flat versus hit the ball with speed and spin versus hit the ball with just spin, can you feel a difference in your hand as you hit the ball? Yeah. Should be able to. Yeah. Different should, resistance. You levels. should be able to. You're going to have my, more vibration. You're going to yeah. feel more vibration when you hit flat. You're going to feel much less vibration when you spin. So Chance and I and Blake are going to be going from table to table going, okay, that Fiona was really good spin. Okay, Bjorn, that one was good spin, but the one previously wasn't good spin. But we're not going to be at your house telling you, that's a good one, that's not, that's a good one, that's not. So the reason that these things are important is because as you understand how to feel the difference when you hit, how to listen for the difference when you hit, how to watch the arc, how to see the reaction from the opponent's racket, you're also going to be able to coach yourself and be able to say, that's how I get more spin, and that's how I get less spin. It's very, very, very important to be able to coach yourself. A few years ago, I changed my forehand, and after I made some improvements in my forehand, I probably started getting 20 or 30 percent more spin than I did before. And I did it with the robot in my basement, working on it on my own. Just very slow balls to my forehand, and I would record it. And I would change my technique, and then I'd go back and watch it, change the technique and watch it. And I would use all these different things. I was trying to listen to the sound. I was trying to feel how it felt. I was trying to watch how the ball spun in the air to see how can I produce more spin. Because my backhand always had pretty good spin, but my forehand was not as spinny. So that's how I tried to change it. So any questions as far as understanding how much spin you're putting on the ball? Okay, and what was the third and final question that I asked last night? What uh, what other variation can you give? Yeah, what? we can use other than spin or speed. Other than spin, okay, so there's different ways how to win a point. And most people are lopsided, they only think of like one way to win a point. So besides putting extreme spin on the ball, or extreme speed on the ball, what other variations can you give to win a point? Placement. Placement, Placement. okay, that's a good one. Good, what else? Zane? Depth. Depth. And depth is actually a really good one. Most blockers, they stay a little too far or they stay a little bit too close. So if the blocker is a step back and I spin shorter, he loses the timing and oftentimes blocks a high ball. If the blocker is really hugging the table right there and I loop deeper, now they're pinned against the table, it's very difficult. So this is one thing that you can practice at home. Even if Ann Winner, if your dad blocks for you, practice looping one a little bit shorter, one a little bit deeper. One a little bit shorter, one a little bit deeper. As a general rule, it's better to loop deep, but you also have to have the variation where you loop short. Especially, let's say, if I'm playing somebody like Chance, and Chance is really in the zone with his forehand counter loop, if I can vary my opening and sometimes loop shorter to the middle, sometimes loop deeper to the corner, it throws off his timing, it's much more difficult for him to counter loop than if I always loop the same depth. Okay? And as you're thinking about this thing for your own game, you also have to think, my opponents are also developing this, and they're also thinking about this as well. So if he's attacking and I'm blocking, how can I adjust to that depth? That's the main problem that blockers have, is all blockers are pretty good at covering here and here and here and here and here and here and here. But very few blockers that I know actually think about adjusting their positioning based on the depth. Okay? That's the main weapon that you use against the blocker, is looping different depths. Good, what else? So we've got, you can vary the speed, vary the spin, vary the placement, vary the depth. Anything else? The height. The height. Okay. Would it ever be advantageous to loop higher? Yes. Good. 